Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Your city station, in cooperation with the New York Academy of Medicine, brings you the first of the season's Lectures to the Laity. The lectures presented by the Academy are open to the public free of charge and are held at the auditorium of the Academy of Medicine, from which we are now broadcasting. The lectures are intended to bring to the layman knowledge and understanding of the new developments in medicine and insight into the processes involving such development. The lecturers are the scientists whose labors in the many fields sum up to this progress in medicine. Their talks, though given in the layman's language, sacrifice none of the precision and reality of the experiences which have made up the knowledge attained. This season's theme is the reciprocal relations between medicine and the other disciplines. Our speaker tonight, delivering the annual Lindsley R. Williams Memorial Lecture, is Dr. Norbert Wiener, Professor of Mathematics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. To open the evening's program, here now is the President of the Academy, Dr. Alexander T. Martin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to open uh, this, uh, these lectures to the laity. Uh, this represents the 19th series of, of these lectures. The, uh, the lectures have been, are under the sponsorship of the Committee on Medical Information, of uh, which Dr. Frank J. McGowan is our chairman, and under the executive secretaryship of Dr. Iago Galston. He and his very able staff have really uh, motivated uh, and arranged for these lectures. Uh, the, the, the lectures themselves have been arranged for by the Committee on Laity Lectures, of which Dr. Harold B. Kies is chairman, and the uh, executive secretary, again, being Dr. Iago Galston. This first lecture tonight of the 19th series uh, is a memorial lecture uh, to Dr. Lindsay R. Williams. Uh, Dr. Lindsay R. Williams, to whose memory this evening's lecture is dedicated, was the first director of our New York Academy of Medicine. He was a man of distinguished character, a genial, intelligent, devoted, and inspiring soul. He died almost 20 years ago, but his, sp his spirit dwells in our midst. Those who were fortunate enough to know him in person retain for him an abiding affection. The laity lectures were initiated shortly after Dr. Williams took over the directorship of this academy. He was an enthusiastic supporter of the series. Because of his broad experience in public health, he keenly appreciated the importance of bringing to the public authentic knowledge on what is going on in medicine and what it means for the profession and for the public. In this, the first lecture of the current series, I salute the memory of a fine man. Uh, <clears throat> this, uh, I'd like to add that this 19th series of lectures to the laity uh, has been dedicated by vote of the Council of the Academy uh, to the uh, bicentennial theme of Columbia University. Uh, Columbia University next year is holding their 200th anniversary. And these lectures are being dedicated to the theme of this bicentennial, which is man's right to knowledge and the free use thereof. Uh, I will now uh, turn the platform over to the chairman of the Committee on the Lectures to the Laity, Dr. Harold B. Kies, who is Director of Surgery and Attending Surgeon at the French Hospital since 1918. Dr. Kies. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Committee on Lady Lectures, again, we welcome you here. We're glad you're here, and we think we will find these lectures a very inspiring series of lectures. As you know, we are on the air, and we wish to thank the radio station WNYC and its director, Mr. Seymour Siegel, 
for their cooperation and their courtesy and their generosity to us so that we may broadcast these lectures. We have distinguished speakers. We likewise have distinguished chairmen. And the chairman of the evening tonight is Dr. Frank Joseph McGowan. Dr. McGowan is a fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine and has been since 1927. He is now chairman of the large committee on medical information. Dr. McGowan's a native New Yorker. He's a graduate of the College of Physicians and Surgeons. He has a distinguished roster of institutions with which he is connected. He's consultant surgeon at Kings Park State Hospital and at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. He's director of surgery at Gouverneur Hospital. He's a visiting surgeon at St. Vincent's Hospital. He's attending surgeon at the Veterans Hospital, associate attending surgeon at New York University, Bellevue Medical Center, associate clinical professor of surgery at New York Hospital, Cornell University, associate clinical professor of surgery at New York University, consulting surgeon at Harlem Hospital. He was a colonel in the Medical Corps of the United States Army, and in addition to that, he has time to devote to the New York Academy of Medicine. I, right, I, right, I introduce Dr. McGowan. Despite the fact that the distinguished gentleman who is to give this evening's lecture is the eminent professor of mathematics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and deals in such esoteric subjects as trigonometric expansion, potential theory, mathematical logic, relativity, and cybernetics, it is, in effect, not difficult to introduce him. To begin with, all that is relevant <clears throat> to his personal life, he has set down in his book entitled Ex Prodigy, My Childhood and Youth. This autobiography was recently published by Simon & Schuster. Then we have previously had the pleasure of Professor Wiener's presence and his performance as a lecturer in our Lady Lecture Series. Hence, we can count upon him as an old friend, and I'm sure known to many of you. Sufficient to say that Professor Wiener is one of the world's outstanding mathematicians, a man of protean interest and seemingly universal competence. At home in several Chinese dialects, at ease with Homeric poetry, reciting from memory long passages of the classic poems, he is an authority on the nonsense rhymes of Lear and thoroughly informed on the obvious and the hidden meaning in Alice in Wonderland. But tonight, Norbert Wiener is neither to talk Chinese, nor recite Homer, nor expound nonsense rhymes. He is, rather, going to initiate the current series of lectures devoted to the theme of the reciprocal relations between medicine and the other disciplines by treating the subject of the evening, the relation of physics to medicine. I am highly honored and take great pleasure in presenting to you Professor Norbert Wiener. We often think of medicine and physics as belonging to quite separate fields, and in fact, the pattern which they have assumed over the greater part of the last century is rather a separate pattern. Now, what I want to discuss is what the pattern of medical treatment and even medical research actually is, what the pattern of physical research actually is, and to show that the conventional way in which these have been put into two sharply differentiated patterns is not, in fact, altogether correct, or at least does not represent the most recent views on the subject. In medicine, well, supposing that we have a patient to be examined, at least I assume I'm talking correctly, I am talking subject to any criticism that can be made, and I hope there will be some. The first thing we do, the patient comes because of some illness or some examination. And one of the first things we do, in addition to examining his present condition, would be to examine his history as well. Then, on the basis of how the present condition, how the, the, of what symptoms are shown, what the present condition is, something like a preliminary prognosis is made. That is an ex a determination of what might be expected after the diagnosis, the prognosis. 
the diagnosis, then the prognosis. Then comes treatment, or if you want a highbrow word for it, therapeutics. And then in view of the treatment, a reassessment of the, uh, possibly of the diagnosis and very likely of the prognosis, there is a continual interplay of two sorts of activity, questioning activity and activity of treatment. But we never forget that we are intervening in a process, in a process we, uh, which is pathological in many cases, or we are at least examining a physiological process with the intent of changing it in a certain direction that we wish to change it, perhaps of making it more normal, but that it is impossible to understand what we are doing in medicine without a thorough understanding of what the notion of process is altogether. Now, in the classical physics, the physics that dominated everything to the end of the last century, while process occurred, it occurred in a peculiarly attenuated form. The physics of the last century was, in essence, the physics of Newton, of the Newtonian laws. And the Newtonian laws represent an environment to physics curiously hostile to the notion that any particular thing causes a particular thing that very sort of notion of cause, which is indispensable to the doctor. The doctor is asking what is causing an illness or what keeps a normal process going at it on its normal level. Questions of causality, questions of degree of causality are always important to him. They're indispensable to him. But in the physics, in the Newtonian physics, the only thing that was responsible for the future of the universe was the presence of the universe with all positions and momenta together with the forces acting. Since the universe was connected together rigidly, the question of what was the cause of what was too loose a notion to have any meaning. Now the idea that a rigid structure is not easy to dissect apart as to its internal stresses and strains is quite true literally and not only true but when it comes to actual physical structures this can be a dangerous fact suppose for example that we have a welded bridge and here I'm talking about a mechanical rigidity the bridge is not made of separate members pinned together so as to allow them to rotate, to allow them to settle out in one possible way only, but the webs are welded or very tightly riveted. And what is more, we're going to have a material which obeys the laws of elasticity perfectly. We're going to have a material like glass. For a material which obeys the laws of elasticity perfectly up to the breaking point is a brittle material. Brittleness means exactly that. It does not mean weakness. It means that when the thing goes, there is no intermediate stage where it nearly obeys the laws of elasticity, but sharply departs from them. What do you have in such a bridge? The truth of the matter is you don't know what that bridge, what strains it's undergoing. You, to do that, you would have to introduce some means that involve the actual bending of the bridge, the fact that it is not perfectly rigid. And if you didn't do that, you would be likely to find enormously large local strains and the, the very slightest cooling or warming or anything happening to it would break it and it would be no good whatever. That's not a theoretical difficulty. That is a difficulty which occurs with materials which are, in a sense, over-rigid in a design which is over-rigid. Now, similarly, in a physical system where only everything causes everything, to determine what is important and what is unimportant has no meaning. Important causes and unimportant causes do not exist in Newtonian physics. They make no sense. And why is Newtonian physics like that? Well, what was the particular place in physics 
in which Newton worked. I do not believe that Newton made a single clean application of what we might call engineering physics. His interests were in gravitational physics and in the physics of uh, astronomy, say in particular in the solar system. Now the solar system is a system which is as unlike as possible the systems we deal with in medicine. In the first place, one of the hardest things to do in medicine and in most branches of physics is to isolate a phenomenon, to separate it from other causes that we have not figured upon that are acting on it. But in gravitational astronomy, a high degree of isolation is very easy. There are two things that might disturb gravitational astronomy. One thing is something outside the solar system. The only thing that I can think of that has a force enough to be of any importance is light. And starlight is very faint light. And while some effect from starlight might be visible on the tail of a comet, I can't think of any other effect on gravitational astronomy which would be likely to show in the century. Starlight is so slight that it represents an almost perfect state of isolation. There's another thing that might interfere with gravitational astronomy. Namely, what's happening on the individual planets. They're not, as we suppose for the first approximation, force points, or even as we suppose for a second approximation, rigid bodies. But elastic bodies, bodies with various internal frictions in them, they do disturb astronomy. There is a phenomenon known as tidal evolution, by which the forces in the moon have ultimately brought, and, and the earth and, and the seas, the moon to face one way, uh, with one side always towards the earth, and those things are well known. But they're extraordinarily slight, and over a decade or so, you could probably forget them quite completely in computing a nautical orbit. The result is that you have furnished for nothing to you an isolated system far more perfect than you can ever get not only in medicine but in engineering physics without any effort to isolate it. And in this you have certain things that are completely abnormal in physics. One of the most interesting things is that computing a nautical almanac ahead and computing it backward are done in just about the same way, merely by reduce, reversing all velocities. Now it's absolutely abnormal for investigation ahead and investigation backward to be as closely parallel as that. For one reason, we can't ask the same questions in most cases. The average physical experiment is something like the following thing. I won't make a physical experiment, but I'll make an experiment. We wanted to study the behavior of rabbits. We put a rabbit in a box, open the box, let the rabbit run loose, and see how it runs. That would be a type of experiment, say, in animal behavior. Now, try to reverse that experiment. Instead of letting rabbits run from boxes where they've been subject to constraints and then act freely later, you want rabbits to run into boxes and be free from constraints for all later history. Well, I may say that the experiment of putting boxes and waiting till rabbits run into them is not a very good experiment. It takes too long. It is surprisingly like uh, the task of the aged, aged man in uh, uh, through the looking glass. Uh, I hunt the, the, the grassy knolls for wheels of hansom cabs. Well, it may be a very edifying occupation, but you are not going to get many hansom cabs that way. Neither are you going to find many rabbits run into your boxes. Well, in other words, the experiment, which I've suggested by the rabbits in the boxes, is typical of what you do in physics. You condition an experiment to a certain uniformity. You do what is called collimation. You make the system arbitrarily uniform. You make it arbitrarily isolated. Then you let its future run free when its past is determined and see what is happening. That is an experiment which we cannot humanly reverse. And the direction of time is an essential part of the experiment. Well, 
Thus, we have two aspects of physics. The symmetrical aspect by the laws of motion with the particular coordinates of the system, the uh, coordinates and velocities causing all the coordinates and velocities of the future, with the causality permeating everything and nothing the specific cause of anything. And the other sort of a system, which is like the rabbit experiment, where we've combed out the past, let the system run free, where certain things affect other things more than others, where the direction of causality is important. And the second, which actually covers what we do in a large part of physics, is also extremely re relevant to what we do in medicine. The whole vocabulary of medicine, of uh, prognosis, treatment, uh, diagnosis, history, and so on, all have to do with the direction of time and the direction of causality. Now, I want to call to your attention that the type of science, the type of art that medicine is, has been spreading of recent years over a very much greater sector of science than that which we have associated with medicine in the past. I wonder how many of you have heard the magic words that were being used all through the war and after the war of operational analysis. Let's see how we would face a military problem, and they're not only military problems nowadays. We want to design an anti-aircraft gun to do some very special task, shoot ahead of an airplane. Well, there again, we've got to investigate how the situation's been in the past, the history. We've got to see what actually happens, how the system operates. We've got to study the physiology of the situation. We've got to study the pathology, how the present operation goes wrong. We've got to diagnose where it goes wrong. We have to determine not only how it goes wrong in a particular case, but what the, f the outcome of a particular program of attack by means of it to, in order to eliminate the dangers of the enemy airplane attack. We've got to uh, make a prognosis there. We've got to introduce a therapeutics, the ways of patching up the attack or modifying the attack so that it will be effective. The whole mode of thought of the man who is doing what is called operational analysis in war is exactly parallel to that of the doctor. Now, this would be interesting if it were in war alone, but this represents something that has, almost immediately after the war, spread out of military action into the largest range of civilian action. In business, for example, one of the outgrowths of what is called operational analysis or the planning of a campaign and so on, from the standpoint of making the means available most effective to accomplish a given end in business, is the question of inventories. That was a terrific headache in the Army, but it's a terrific headache in civilian business. You have a plant that covers the whole country. You have warehouses. These warehouses are localized, are placed locally with certain ex access to certain markets, certain access to certain factories, and so on. You know that if you load up your warehouses unnecessarily, you're tying up material as capital, you will have to pay interest to keep it, and you're losing money, and may lose it hand over fist, and may go bankrupt on big inventory. You know that if you have small inventories, the inventories are too small, and you've got to turn orders away, you're going to lose the business of these orders, but what's more, you may lose the goodwill of these orders and have to pay at a penalty rate for your carelessness, a penalty rate that is something like a penalty clause in an engineering job. It may actually be a penalty clause that you have to pay. You know, in other words, that you've got to, through this complication of things, steer a policy. And that this policy involves both a knowledge of the physiology of business and the pathology of business. There has been a great deal of progress actually made in the use of mathematical methods allied to those which were used 
in war operational analysis in this field, and it is now an established method of working. I'll tell you another problem which is aligned to this that has come up recently, very much in practice. You want to design a machine, say an alarm clock. Now in designing this alarm clock, your final object is to keep a certain accuracy. But this accuracy depends upon a whole lot of things that you do. The different parts come into action, not simultaneously, but successively. One way of saving accuracy may be by putting more work, say, onto the mainspring. Another work, another thing may be by uh, spending more of attention in cutting the pallets. And I can think of dozens of things. Another is to use in the uh, uh, spring something with less hysteresis, less energy loss. Now, when you consider the way that you build to your final, final accuracy, there may be dozens, there may be hundreds of ways. But in general, they won't cost the same. And one of the problems of design is to do this with a minimum cost. It won't always be minimum cost. You might have a similar problem in medicine, where you are trying to design the different parts of a treatment to produce a certain effect within certain limits, but with some minimum strain otherwise on the health of the patient. Something has got to be minimized or maximized. This has been reduced to mathematics. The mathematics is not easy to solve, but at least the fundamental form of the solution has been envisaged. It ties up with a concept of the problem where the chief things that you're working with are not measures, but probabilities of measures. And I myself, have contributed some mathematical tools which give us promise of being very useful in this field. But there you see an, uh, something that is being done on a mathematical, on an, uh, on an engineering level, which is very parallel in its general conception to what is being done in medicine. Now, what I want to say is that not only this very special group of operational problems is assuming a form parallel to that of medicine, but I can go further. That the general concept of the physics of the present day is much closer to the study of operational methods in engineering design than it might have been thought to be 50 years ago. The rigid physics of 50 years ago with no probability, with no individual thing causing anything, more or less, but simply everything in the past causing everything in the future, has now gone. And the first step of the passing of that original physics took place between 1900 and 1903 in the United States. And the man who did this in New Haven was Willard Gibbs. There's some very interesting history of science to be given there. Because Gibbs did a piece of work which made everybody think not in terms of the single system going from a single set of causes to a single set of effects, but of a, a distribution of systems, in some of which certain causes were more important than others in producing certain effects, that when you made a certain variation in the cause, some made a big variation in the effect and some made a small, Gibbs introduced this whole point of view which was known as statistical mechanics, and which was without doubt the finest piece of scientific work ever done in the United States. Gibbs' sense of what he was doing was perfectly right. There was only one little thing to be said. 
that the details of what he did were completely wrong. That the sort of thing he was trying to do was right, but when he tried to define it more closely, there was nothing in the world that answered to the thing he was describing. That what he called his ergodic hypothesis, which allowed people to compare averages over sets of systems and averages over time, was invented to do a very necessary task, but didn't do that task. The more surprising thing still is that at the time, at the very moment that Gibbs was working on this new physics, which he saw but could not fully justify in detail, two men in France were doing exactly what Gibbs needed, the two men being Borel and Lebesgue. Borel, who was still alive, was best described by a friend of mine, Professor Loewe of the University of California, as a three-dimensional physicist, a three mathematician, a man who had a sense of physical reality all the time. And the very great mathematician, Lebesgue, who worked under him, who was directed as to what he was trying to get by Borel, but got the result that Borel was unable to get, was described to me by Loewe as a flat mathematician, a man interested in the abstract rather than the physical application. They did the work which, 30 years later, was going to give the path to justify what Gibbs had done, which hadn't been done for 30 years. And the work was done, again in this country, by Professor G. D. Berkhoff at Harvard, following outlines done by von Neumann at Princeton and by Koopman at Columbia. Even before that, about 1920, 10 years before that, I'd been working in a similar field, and I'd made one of the very early applications of the LeBeg integral to a particular Gibbsian piece of work in the study of the Brownian motion. Well, it has then been, for as long as the scientific life as anybody here, the custom in physics not to ask the question, what is one system going to do in the future if you give it its precise initial conditions and get it low, let it go, and uh, this was a good spoonerism, but what will happen if you take a large number of systems and discuss what happens to them statistically on the average? Now, under those conditions, certain changes produce a result more sensitively than other changes. And you can call, talk of amount of causality. Now, the first result in the new physics was this Gibbsian stage, in which the individual systems behaved as they should in Newtonian systems, but you are asking new questions about them, namely, not what would happen to a single system, but what would probably happen to one of a distribution of systems. In 1925, a new step was made, which led to something which was seen from the very beginning to have a close relation to the work of Gibbs, but was also seen to be very different in that Newton's laws of dynamics were given up and replaced by new laws, and that the questions we asked were still statistical questions. This is called the quantum mechanics. It has proved enormously successful. It did not immediately take a purely Gibbsian form. I think I can say that some work that I've been doing recently indicates, however, that it can be reduced to a form very closely parallel to that of Gibbs, and it represents a new step in which not only do we have statistical systems of mechanics instead of single rigid systems, but even these statistics are not the statistics of systems satisfying Newton's laws at all. Well then, what I have said may seem to indicate merely 
that medicine is, that uh, physics is taking a form more compatible with that of medicine than it, ha than it has in the past. And that would be a very unsatisfactory state to leave this lecture in, and would be, besides, very misleading, because what has happened is not only a deflection of physics in the direction of medicine, but a very great deflection of medicine in the direction of physics. There are two sorts of phenomena that I will mention this in connection with. One type of phenomena, phenomenon is the phenomenon of homeostasis. We know that the body can only exist under very narrow physical circumstances. That was brought out by Lawrence J. Henderson in The Fitness of the Environment, but it goes back to older ideas of Cannon and of Claude Bernard concerning homeostasis. It would only take a few degrees of temperature to kill any one of us, and that temperature is not maintained simply by packing the outside with materials at the right temperature. We definitely tend to resist a change in temperature. If we drink cold water, well, something happens to oppose that and prevent us being overchilled by it. If we go out in the sun, there's something that makes us perspire that tends to prevent our getting a fever. You know how a room here can be equipped with a thermostat so that if anything tends to warm the room, the thermostat tends to cool it. And you know how such a thermostat, besides its normal functioning in keeping the room at fairly constant temperature, may itself misbehave and have diseases. I don't suppose there's anybody here who hasn't had the habit of building a fire in the fireplace in the room in which his house thermostat has, and therefore, inadvertently, cooling the house by building the fire. Of course it does. It makes the thermostat read wrong and uh, tell you that it is warmer than it is, and so you cool the house. Well, fever itself is a disease of that sort. Something happens to cool the body because something in the whole mechanism which records departures from temperature and tends to bring them back to normal, has gone wrong. And this concept that diseases can be diseases of homeostasis, diseases of the process which tends to control abnormalities in temperature, is, in my humble opinion, a very potent notion. Now, there are plenty of cases besides that where one of the places where we should look for disease is in the mechanism that tends to keep body conditions constant and that where there's a certain amount of evidence that that's exactly where some of the trouble occurs. For example, one very interesting thing has been found. Don't ask me for the reference. I'm giving it in the paper that I give to be published, but I can't put my hand on it uh, at once. Some work has been done on liver regeneration. As you know, the liver is almost the only organ of the human body which shows in the adult state very extensive regeneration. And by the way, the Greeks must have known that, otherwise they wouldn't have uh, put the vulture at Prometheus liver. <laughs> because it's, it is one of the few organs that you can carve pieces away from continuously for a considerable time and have the tissue come back to pass. I think that is correct. The interesting thing is this, that if you do carve pieces from a person's liver, it regenerates. But there is a mechanism which tends to hold the regeneration, at any rate with the animals we've worked with, at the point when enough is regenerated. Apparently, when a sufficient 
has regenerated, then in one way or another, a process is turned on that cuts down the rate of regeneration and prevents the regeneration from running, wa running wild. And regeneration, run uh, regeneration running wild may not be cancer, but it's so much like it that the difference isn't tremendous. It's regeneration is uncontrolled when the regeneration is complete. The process has a certain similarity to cancerous process. Now, we ran into that in something that is a quasi-cancerous process. I was working with a young man at Mojave. And we were discussing leukemia. And in leukemia, you have a very interesting thing. You have an excessive formation of leukocytes. Now, there are two different processes which occur, the production and destruction of leukocytes. We know this, that the rate of increase of leukocytes in leukemia, while it's relatively fast, is far, far slower than the rate of production of leukocytes. Now notice what this means. It means that the rate of increase is produced by production and destruction, which are still rather closely keyed to one another. Because if they were not keyed to one another, and you made one of them vary a great deal, the percentage variation in the difference would be enormously greater. Therefore, you still seem to have something connecting production and destruction, whose rate of action has all gone wrong but not so completely wrong that some attempt to produce normality cannot be recognized. In other words, we have a situation which seems to me to fit the notion of a diseased homeostasis, which is, however, not yet a non-existent homeostasis. A non-existent homeostasis would not tend to give a small quantity as the difference between two large ones. If the production and destruction were still not keyed to one another, then the difference between them would go altogether wild. That is one field, the field of homeostasis, and the related field of cancer and cancerous-like diseases, where I think that something like operational analysis, the study of process, may be a very useful tool in the future. The study of feedback processes, the same repertory of notions which is used in operational analysis may be very promising there in the future. That is one thing. Now I'll go to a very different field where I have been doing something rather like operational analysis and still more like ordinary physics. And that is the study of brain waves. You know these electrical waves in the brain, the alpha rhythm and the various other rhythms. Now, the obvious thing to do to them is to just look at them, see the ups and downs of the voltage, see how frequently the thing repeats, and study brain waves that way. And that is the way the greater part of the work has been done until recently. But it's becoming apparent on various sides that there's a lot more to brain waves than meets the eye that way. On the one hand, Gray Walter and his school are studying complicated pieces of apparatus to give the space pattern of brain waves in the brain and seeing what they can do that way. But the Mass General Hospital group, Dr. Brazier, Dr. Cobb, their disciples and myself, are working on the thing in a different way. In the first place, taking one place in the brain only, we have tried to analyze these waves by what we call the autocorrelation, to take the wave at one time, the wave a certain delay later, multiply them, and then see how that curve goes, how the average of that goes as the displacement in time is increased. Now, we have observed that when we do that, and first, that the so-called alpha rhythm, which is about nine per second, shows up 
much more sharply than we would expect. And when we use the methods that we use for analyzing what we would call time series and economics, uh, which are very much like the phenomena of optics and physics, we find that this method of getting what we call the parallelogram shows a wave that keeps up consistently with itself, although it occurs nine times a second, for one and probably two seconds. Well, in the first place, we found there was something there to go on. And one rule in good scientific work is that you can avoid looking for a thing if it isn't there. But if you find something that is there and is just at the edge of the power of your instrument to show, even though it shows clearly, you are under a moral obligation to improve your instrument so it shows more clearly and you run through it. We did this, or we are doing this, we haven't done it yet, with this alpha rhythm. And then after we had done this work that showed this extremely sharp character of the alpha rhythm, which we did not expect in advance, but which is there and therefore forces us to study it, we saw that the methods we were using to do it, instead of being as new as we thought they were, were methods that the physicists had been using extensively about 30 years ago. We found, in short, the tool we were using to study brain waves was essentially the same tool, the same tool that Michelson had been using to study light waves, the interferometer. And if you remember, Michelson, by the aid of the interferometer, was able to measure the disk of the stars. He was able to take two mirrors a hundred feet apart, reflect the light together, let it interfere, observe the fringes, as they're called in the interferometer, and by seeing how many fringes he got before they disappeared, determine the disk of the star. It was an unusual method for fine physical measurements. What we are doing is spiritually the same thing with the brain waves, and we're finding that this uh, corellogram we're using is nothing but an interferometer, and that we are measuring something like the disk of a brain wave, and that it is smaller and sharper, that we can measure it even when it is smaller and, sh and sharper than we thought we had any right to measure. We're measuring new things because we're forced to measure new things because we can. When you come to a precise instrument, you may avoid using it if you're convinced that it won't show anything even if you use it. But if you once have used a precise instrument, which shows something that you haven't seen before, you will never get rid of using it in the future. Because the thing you're looking for is there, and you might as well look for it in each case and see if it's there. So that, We've been using fine physical methods, which we're using on economic statistics, fine statistical methods, which we're using in optics on brain waves, and they are at least showing a beginning of paying off. We're quite certain that this method is good because it shows something. It shows something that is much too consistent to be there by accident. If it had given us a miss, we could miss it in further work. But once that there is something there, we can no longer assume it isn't there, and we are under a moral duty to study it. That will probably give us much more precise results in the study of brain waves in the future. What it will lead to us to, physiologically and pathologically, I don't know. But it shows so much that is so verifiable and so detailed that I shall be one of the most astonished people in the world if it doesn't show us a lot more which can be used physiologically, pathologically, med medically. Another thing that we're doing along the line of Gray Walter's work, we're studying several parts of the brain together, and we're finding that this brain wave has definite phase relations, surprisingly sharp, between the different parts of the brain. You can see clear delays of something like a twentieth of a second or so, between when it starts in one and when it starts in the other, which could only be found by instruments of this sort. Actually, uh, without instruments of this sort, we might miss the alpha rhythm, as it's called, altogether. It could exist, but only be findable by instruments of this sort. Furthermore, the mathematics that goes with this new treatment of brain waves that we're developing enables us to give a clean meaning to the question 
which part of the brain is driving which, and may ultimately lead us in the direction of investigating or suggesting anatomical and physiological connections between different parts of the brain corresponding between their firing relations in time. In other words, the type of mathematical analysis which happens to be precisely that, which is developing itself in other operational fields as the standard technique of operational analysis, is also finding application in medicine in this field. I say medicine, in physiology in this field, but I am one of those who believes that good physiology now means good pathology tomorrow and good therapeutics the day after tomorrow. I thank you very much. You've been listening to the first in the 1953-54 series of Lectures to the Laity. Our speaker tonight has been Dr. Normick Wiener, Professor of Mathematics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Wiener's subject was the application of physics to medicine. The presiding chairman was Dr. Frank J. McGovern. The next lecture to be given on Wednesday, November 18th at 8.30 p.m. will, of course, be open to the public and again broadcast by your city station. The speaker will be Dr. Theodore Shedlovsky of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. The laity lectures presented by the New York Academy of Medicine as a free service to the people of New York City are broadcast by your city station direct from the Academy Auditorium as a public service. We return you now to our studios in the Municipal Building. This is the Municipal Broadcasting System. You try to get a physiologist to say that the nervous system is a chemical machine or an electrical machine, and you will find out the only answer he will give you is an electrochemical machine. Does the concept of negative causality? Well, all that I can say is that if we try to work the future back on the past, your techniques for such an examination will have to be exactly like those of the rabbits. You'll have to open boxes and let the rabbits run into them, which, as I have said, is not a very economical technique of experimentation. We can only experiment one way effectively because we only run one way effectively, and it really doesn't matter too much whether the universe only runs one way effectively, because experimenting is a relation between us and the universe, and not simply something that deals with the universe alone. I think that's the answer to that question. Define what is this? Biophysics, there are really two things I'm talking about. The use of techniques which belong to science in general in application to living and human beings as well as to uh, what we ordinarily recognize machines. But biophysics is also the study of phenomena already recognized in physics as in uh, of non-living non material as parts of the phenomena of living material. There are more traps in that, by the way, than you might think. I'm delighted that I have here a, uh, a physical chemical colleague, but I I'm going to ask him to give me a statement about one little question in biophysics. One of the things that you need in the study of an ordinary uh, physical system is a study of the distribution of temperatures in it. In physical chemistry, temperature is an extremely Im important notion. One of the things, Dr. Shedlovsky, I'd like you to help me out in is what can you mean by such a thing as a local temperature in a living tissue? That's going to be very important because I want to show that biophysics cannot be taken too accurately as, a picture, as the same thing in detail as you have 
with physics of less organized systems, and the subject is full of facts. Uh, well, we have to ask how to talk about it in two weeks. It takes a long time. Uh, I know what you have in mind. Do you want to speak of the temperature of radiation? And well, not really that. What do you mean? How are you going to measure the temperature of a, a single small part of a cell? And does it mean anything? It doesn't mean anything. That's exactly the point. In other words, some of the physical consequences, there, is, there were some points of view from which, if you are discussing a single human cell and a small part of that cell, the nearest thing that you can get to a temperature in it would be something like the temperature of a steam boiler. Is television now contributing to health? Could homeostasis apply in communications health? Now, that seems to me to be a great variety of questions. Can it be used as a means of administering health? Certainly. Is there such a thing as the health of the body politic from the point of view of communications? Also certainly, and I don't think it's I think it needs to uh, have its pulse taken at present. <laughs> but uh, is communication effectively acting as a way of communicating to the, uh, contributing to the communicative integrity of the country? I have my dudes. <laughs> I don't want to say it isn't, but I have my dudes. No. But it does. Uh, a great deal of it does involve that it can be studied as a somewhat isolated entity. In other words, the degree of isolation that you need for that sort of thing is the degree of isolation that every doctor postulates anyhow. That to a certain extent, he can control and, isolated those factor, and isolate those factors that penetrate the body from outside to such an extent that he can study their relation with other factors in the body. If that couldn't be done, medicine would be a hopeless art. Do you recommend that more instruction in physics and or mathematics should be included in medical school curricula? Excellent question, but I will not give a unique answer to it. I am saying that there are certainly people in work that is now called medical and physiological work, who can need and whose successors will need more mathematics and physics than they're getting now. To what extent medicine can hold together as a single profession with these developments coming up, I don't know. But at least there will be branches of medicine which involve as much physics and chemistry and engineering and mathematics and their training in the future, as, shall we say, uh, psychoanalysis involves psychology now. That is, medicine is not going to stick to be permanently for the future the career of the man who carries a stethoscope in his hat, as engineering is the career of the man who carries a slide rule in his hip pocket. There's going to be a considerable group of young men in the future who carry both the stethoscope in their hat and a slide rule in their hip pocket. <laughs> How did Gibbs get right answers by reading? For methodologists of science to include this in their study? Yes. It's by not to include this in their study? Yes. It's by not to include this in their study? Yes. It's by no means rare. The point is that the scientist who is worth his salt has an uncanny skill in seeing the structure of an idea before it has attained to perfect definition. As a matter of fact, if he can't do that, he will never get to the later stage where his idea does have a high degree of definition and he masters it. One of the most difficult arts to acquire and to understand of the scientist is to master the main points in the incompletely understood. 
But if you don't do it, you will not go very far in science. But as to rules to do it, how does a man write a piece of music that hasn't yet been written? How does he write, how does he write it in the stage when it has not yet formed himself? How does a man write a novel when he doesn't know what he's going to say? How does a man paint a picture when he hasn't finished it? This extreme problem, and it is one of the most difficult working problems of a scientist, to carry a pattern as a going concern before it has clarified itself in all its details is a thing that one must know to some extent or other or one won't be a real scientist, but I'm afraid the only way to learn it is to be thrown up against the problem in his apprenticeship. But this is not a rare experience. It is not rare for a good scientist to be writer than his own statement. Do I consider organic matter and inorganic matter similar but differently organized? Yes, but I don't consider it differently organized. That does not mean there can be no organization in inorganic matter. The chief thing is the high degree of organization in organic matter. In organic matter, we can make machines that have structures, yes, we can make inorganic matter have structures, but what I'm talking about now is not only a theoretical difficulty, but a very practical difficulty. One of our great difficulties in handling organic matter is also one of our great difficulties in making efficient automata, making efficient machines of any sort, and that is, just as I was speaking in connection with temperature, for study of organic matter, or even for the detailed control of chemical processes, or fine structure processes in inorganic matter, we need instruments themselves of much finer structure than any we have. Instruments that can read temperatures of a region a thousandth the part of which we can read a temperature now instruments that can read concentrations of chemicals, micro-instruments which can be made in large number. I know that one of my colleagues at Tech, quite apart from any suggestion by mine, Campbell, is trying to introduce into the chemical industry new methods of building micro-instruments for process control, and in doing that, he's really approaching very close to the main problem of the difference between organic and inorganic matter which does not mean organic and inorganic compounds, by the way. Is it largely a matter of accident that physics and medicine are integrating, or are there certain definable sociological causes? There are sociological causes, namely that it's becoming necessary for the doctors to be more aware of physical things, and it's becoming necessary for, as I have said, the physicists to take a less purely astronomical view of things, but these are not only sociological causes. There is one very familiar phenomenon in science, that when a new tool is found, there is an urge to use it over the whole front over which it can be used. And with new tools being found in both these fields, it is not at all surprising that somebody gets a hint from a new tool in one field and tries to use it in another. So I think that the cause is both sociological and the general cause belonging to the development of science itself. Furthermore, the great synthesizing period of science, the 17th century, many people thought ran out in the detail of the 19th century, that all the great questions had been answered and nothing more would be left for the science of the future but measuring another decimal point. We know now that that isn't so. And therefore, we have more inducement than we ever had to search for help in science wherever we can find it, to not score it in different fields of science. And in short, I think the point of view of a scientist uh, such as Leibniz is actually more in fashion now, now than it was 50 years ago. Is there any other? I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, time will not permit any further questions. Uh, I will now turn the meeting back to Dr. Harold Collins.
kindly remember that on November 18th, the succeeding uh, lecture in this series will be given, and as you can see by your program, the title is The Relation of Electrochemistry <coughs> to Medicine by Dr. Theodore Shedlovsky, who is on the platform tonight and has helped with the interpretation of these questions. He is a member of the Rockefeller Institute of Medical Research, and we can promise you a most interesting meeting. Good night.